Hi, placemakers. Rob Tullis here with the third of five short videos dealing with some placemaking techniques. If you've watched the introduction to this series, you know that I'm preaching that architects and urban designers should put place before project, that they should be conscious of the spaces between urban buildings as a setting for human activities, and that their building designs can help define these spaces and enhance the sense of place felt in them. But we're here to discuss how how are designers to put place before project in order to help transform space into place? So in this third of five talks, I'll demonstrate a technique for planning the spaces between urban buildings by looking at precedence as a benchmark, a yardstick, if you will, for measuring exterior urban space. In talk two, I focused on Boston's Creek Square and its similarities, or possible sim exploiting the possible similarities, of Siena's Piazza del Campo. Here in talk three, I'll use Boston City Hall Plaza as my guinea pig and relate it to the spaces in Florence's Piazza della Signoria. And in talks four and five, I'll demonstrate a technique for using mannerism in designing the building facades that define and face such city spaces. So let's get into City Hall Plaza now. You may know that Siena's Piazza del Campo, which I analyzed in talk two of this series, served as a model for Boston City Hall Plaza at least for the use of sloped brickwork in the paving. But of course, our space in Boston is not anywhere near as successful as Siena's. This figure ground comparison of those two spaces, drawn at the same scale, reveals just how different they are. At Siena, the diagram clearly shows the almost total enclosure of Piazza del Campo. It reads as a defined figural void carved from the urban fabric of the city's buildings. The roads that lead into the piazza have a distinct linear spatial character in contrast to the piazza. While in Boston, the figure ground reveals that the enclosure is almost non-existent. The roadways formlessly merge into the plaza's environment and the space leaks out at all corners. As the Notre Dame thesis from which I took the diagrams and quote points out, their degrees of spatial definition are almost the inverse of each other. Unlike at Siena, where the Piazza del Campo evolved in phases on the site of a sloping field, Boston City Hall Plaza replaced a dense network of streets and buildings at one moment in time. In the late 1800s, a wide intersection in that street network, known as Scully Square, gave its name to the entire district around it. In 1962, demolition of the district was begun in order to affect I.M. Pei's master plan for Government Center, the centerpiece of a new Boston, that could compete economically with cities like New York. This overlay of the former, former Scully Square and current government center street and block patterns show the extent of the demolition required and the few blocks that have survived unchanged. Note the remaining fragment in black at the right. This is Creek Square, the subject of my talk two in this series. But let's stay on City Hall Plaza. As this perimeter use study shows, today's City Hall Plaza is dominated by government use, both at City Hall and at the adjacent federal buildings. These are shown in yellow and orange and account for 80% of the plaza's perimeter. What's worse is that much of this frontage consists of blank walls or inaccessible windows. What ground level retail use there is, shown in red and maroon, remain separated from the plaza's edges by roads or by changes in grade. So at Boston City Hall Plaza, both form and use contribute to its lack of active edge. City Hall Plaza is begging to be used as an example of, of speculative redesign. It's been the subject of a number of failed redesign and redevelopment attempts since the 1980s. I sometimes sketch these ideas just for myself when I visit a space and get an idea for improvement. Probably half the architects in Boston have fooled around with ideas for this space. And here, I'll show you mine. So here's my process. I start with an aerial photo at a measurable scale. I then outlined all the important existing conditions, converting that photo into a workable but general base plan. Then I added all the geometrical relationships that I thought were important. The red lines all show the centers and quadrants of surrounding buildings, the locations of major entries, the extended axes of adjacent icons, and view corridors that seemed important or possible. Line A is Hanover Street extended. Line B is the center line of Fannell Hall and Quincy Market, downhill from the plaza. 
Line C is the geometry of Center Plaza, uh, an office building that's across Tremont Street. And D is the extension of Washington Street past the old state house to the plaza. I then reinforced uh, these desire lines, terminating them or framing them with possible solid forms. I indicated that a route up the stairs leading from Fano Hall, while a good urban connection, should actually terminate in a tall eye target, and I've labeled that C. I also indicated enclosure walls to better define the southern edge of those stairs and the northeasterly leakage of the space at Hanover Street. Those are both labeled B. And I proposed a boundary to address the ill-defined limits of the space along Tremont Street. That's marked A. I suggested a three-part configuration of that enclosure might relate to the three sections and two entrances at the center plaza building across Tremont Street. I then benchmarked the open space with a well-known and successful precedent. Rather than use Siena's Piazza del Campo, I referenced Florence's Piazza della Signoria because it occurred to me that its three differently proportioned and linked spaces have a similar relationship as those that are almost but not quite defined at City Hall Plaza. You see those three spaces outlined in red on Ed Bacon's diagram of Piazza della Signoria. Space A is the main piazza in front of the Palazzo Vecchio, Florence's City Hall. Space B is the smaller square at the side of the Palazzo Vecchio to its north. Space C is the narrow Uffizi Piazzetta, a corridor of urban space leading to Florence's river. It occurred to me that these three spaces and proportions and relationships are kind of hinted at at Boston, sort of waiting to be defined within the ill-formed free space that swirls around our city hall. So I overlaid Piazza della Signoria's three spaces at scale, inserting them more or less in relationship to City Hall as to the Palazzo Vecchio. Such a historic reference offers a speculative way that one might emphasize the latent opportunity for a network of defined spaces linked in sequence around a major structure like City Hall, rather than having it stand as an isolated object in a large void. And it's useful to benchmark urban space sizes. Note that I'm proposing to raise space A's grade, leveling it so that it's more usable for both civic and lingering activities. I would concentrate the grade change north of City Hall to create a more pronounced and distinctive spatial event, connecting down to the grade at the end of Hanover Street. I then shifted the three spaces around to conform to the specific opportunities presented by Boston's existing buildings. Note that Florence's long and narrow Uffizi, space C, fits nicely into the plaza-like extension of Washington Street, and that space B, north of Florence's city hall, can occupy an identical spot north of Boston's. The main piazza space, west of, piazza, of, of Palazzo Vecchio's main entry, marked A, when positioned with an identical relationship to our city hall's front door, gives a clue for how big the Boston public space should be. Then I sort of filled in the blanks. Buildings and additions south of City Hall extend and define the linear plaza connecting to the old state house. They're marked B. A proposed corner feature acts as a hinge point, much like Florence's Loggia de Lanzi. Another infill building across Congress Street at the northeast defines the street edge and creates an entry portal at the end of Hanover Street. It's marked E. A strengthening of the tree bosque on the federal building's elevated plaza would help define this space, but a thin linear building would be even better, similar to the hotel that was proposed in 2000. Finally, the biggest move, marked A, is the construction of three buildings along Tremont Street to reduce the size of the main plaza and define its west edge, preventing the leakage along Tremont that now occurs. While a bit smaller than the ideal office floor plates, they're reasonable for center core commercial buildings. They could be tall and slender or about eight stories to match center plaza and create a strong Tremont Street street wall. In either case, the path proportioned spaces between them could function as an animated pedestrian street if bordered on both sides of the ground floor by cafes and convenience retail, and better yet, covered with glass roofs or bridges connecting the three buildings. These two pedestrian streets align with the center plaza arcades across Tremont. 
I propose something similar to the row of statues that fronts Florence's Palazzo Vecchio, showing monuments, Mark D, across the dead brick frontage of City Hall. Alternatively, one could eliminate the current stairs and barriers to the upper level central courtyard and open up this frontage, locating a cafe there within City Hall's floor space. Depending on the final grade, it might be possible to link through this cafe to the courtyard. The southernmost of these three buildings takes on the added urban responsibility of serving as an eye target for the approach up the stairs from Fanel Hall and should offer a similar visual terminus for the straight portion of Tremont Street before it curves to the northwest. The fact that this building would contain the headhouse for the T, Boston subway system, at its base really makes it an active urban player and the southwest gatehouse of a more controlled and distinct City Hall Plaza design. This uh, T headhouse was recently rebuilt as an all glass one story structure, a tall one story. While it's a nice piece of architecture, it does little to help add enclosure to the space. I'm of the opinion that the new headhouse should have at least had a clock tower or similar eye target to engage in an urban dialogue with the Sam Adams statue across from the foot of these stairs. I've superimposed Sienna's Torre de Mangia in this photo to help make my point. My three Tremont Street buildings might produce a space similar to Josh Simino's photo montage in which he superimposes Brussels Grand Place buildings into the same position as my infill buildings to better define and size the plaza relative to its public use and to City Hall. And they'd provide some income against which to finance some of my proposed interventions. Finally, my proposed concentration of the grade change at the Hanover Street Gateway north of City Hall could function as a miniature Spanish steps. As one of my BAC students observed, it bears the same relationship to Hanover Street as those steps do to Rome's Via Condotti, but without any of the sense of theater. So there's a quick example of how historic precedent can be used, abstracted, and manipulated, but nonetheless applied to a similar urban problem to help formulate and test speculative interventions. This methodology can often be useful as designers focus on place over project and try to transform space into place. Thank you.